right, then let's go ahead and get into the Sunday School lesson for today. Today is going to be a shorter lesson. We're only going to be looking at one verse, and, and there's not too much to it, but it's going to give us some groundwork for the following paragraph. So it's important for us to look at this verse and uh, still that interference. And so we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 today, which is the conclusion of a sentence uh, that spans from verse 18. And let's go ahead and start in verse 15, because this gives us our context, because this whole uh, sentence is a conversation, uh, is a uh, statement about how we can walk circumspectly and wisely in this present time. So let's go ahead and start in verse 15. He says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and unto the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so today we're going to talk about the subject of who do you fear? Uh, the question, who do you fear today? Uh, in verse 21, we're concluding that paragraph that we were uh, going over before, talking about how we can walk circumspectly and wisely. And last lesson, we looked at verse 19 and, uh, the, and the, the rest of verse 19 and verse 20. In verse 19, we uh, concluded our study of how the verse relates to music. Uh, we saw that the Christian is not just commanded to sing corporately, but also to sing individually. Uh, we also saw what the term singing and making melody refer to. And we saw what the terms in your heart and to the Lord refer to. And we saw how music is a vital tool that God commands that we implement in our lives. And that every Christian needs. And which enables the Christian to live the victorious Christian life. We also studied verse 20, wherein we saw the need for the Christian to also give thanks in order to walk circumspectly and wisely. Uh, we saw that giving thanks is more than just an attitude of thankfulness. It actually is referring to the act of giving thanks to God. We also saw that the Christian is to be giving thanks always, whether in good or bad times, and that the Christian is to be giving thanks for all things, irrespective of the Christian's circumstantial conditions, his physical conditions, the amount of his possessions, or whether or not he's under persecution. The Christian is still supposed to always give thanks in all things. And we also saw that the Christian is commanded to give thanks particularly to our God and Father, and, uh, would, and that we're also to give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also saw how the Christian needs uh, to give thanks publicly, not just privately. Uh, the idea of always refers to both when it's private and public, and that if the Christian doesn't give thanks, it's an indication that he has issues with pride, with selfishness, and with self-dependence. And we talked about the need for us to not be self-dependent, but to be dependent upon God and the Holy Spirit, and to be thankful for all things that God has done for us and given us. <clears throat> and so today, uh, we're going to be going into verse 21, uh, studying a verse that concludes the prior paragraph, and at the same time introduces another paragraph, uh, consisting of the verses from chapter 5, verse 22, through chapter 6, verse 9. There we see another paragraph. Uh, just because I say it's a paragraph doesn't mean that it's necessarily a biblical paragraph. Just like, uh, you know, I might choose the wrong paragraph in places uh, where they end and begin, uh, just like the uh, just like the King James translators, you know, might maybe chose the wrong chapter divisions. I'm not really happy with the chapter division where it's at uh, between chapters five and six because it's kind of breaking up uh, the middle of what I would consider a paragraph. So the 
obviously the, the chapter divisions and my paragraph divisions or anybody's paragraph divisions are not inspired. Uh, but the point is uh, that I personally would, would see this as a new paragraph and that it's also relating to another subject uh, that we'll be delving into uh, next lesson. Um, but here in verse 21, it's introduced. And so we're going to study verse 21 here where that new subject and that new paragraph is, going, is introduced uh, there in verse 21. I don't believe that the phrase in verse 21 is ambiguous. Some might see this and say, what is this referring to? This could be referring to anything. And they might think of it as a detached phrase, that uh, this could be referring to something else outside of context. Uh, and that it could just be saying that we, that every Christian should be submitting to everyone, to all Christians or to everybody in the church. I personally don't believe that Paul is here saying that everyone should generally submit to one another, uh, which could cause confusion about to whom they should submit and how they should, how they should submit and, uh, and how they would submit in different, vari in different uh, situations and different relationships. I also don't believe that Paul is here generally referring to the relationships of one another in the church, of the members of the church. I don't believe that the sphere of application here of this verse is directly to the relationships of the members of the church, which is kind of interesting because you don't normally hear that about this verse. Uh, you, people would normally say that he's here talking about the members of the church. Uh, I believe Paul here has a particular reason for this statement in context, and that Paul is going to give us an explanation and application uh, for this phrase in the following paragraph. I believe it's explained in the context. And so in verse 21, Paul is here introducing that next paragraph. And so he's pointing out, I believe, two important underlying concepts here uh, in this phrase. The first important concept that Paul is pointing out here is that generally everyone is in one or more relationships that require submission. Every one of us is in a relationship or more uh, that requires our submission. Uh, Paul is going to address in the following uh, paragraph five, uh, three of five different relationship paradigms. Uh, we have different uh, spheres of relationships of authority and submission uh, that uh, Paul is going to address three of them in verses 22 through uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, first, we're going to see uh, that sphere of authority, the, uh, the concern of authority and, and uh, submission uh, applied to the husband and wife's relationship in verses 22 through 33. And then we're going to look at the issue of authority and submission between the parents' and children's relationship addressed in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6. And then we're going to address the master and the servant's relationship in verses 5 through 9. Uh, and I, that's three of them. And then there's two other relationship uh, spheres of relationship or authority. Uh, can anybody guess what those other two are? Where there's authority and submission required. Outside of the home, and outside of the master and servant, there's other places where we have authority. In the church, ecclesiastical authority. And another one is governmental authority. And so we, although this principle of verse 21 applies to the ecclesiastical relationship between the pastor and the members of the church, that relationship, along with its scope and application, was already addressed in depth when we studied Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and verse 17 and verse 24. And we went into that in depth, and Pastor also added some comments on that subject as well. Also, uh, although this principle of also applies to the governmental relationship between uh, a godly, God-fearing government, Notice that I'm saying that that government should be godly and God-fearing for it to be legitimate, and its subjects. Uh, that relationship, along with its scope and application, was already addressed in our Sunday School series in depth when we studied Romans 13. Uh, we addressed that 
uh, authority of the government. And so we're going to be addressing these three relationship paradigms as we come to them in this paragraph. And so in the following paragraph, Paul is not just saying, here's the point where he says that we are to submit one to another. Uh, the following paragraph, Paul is not just saying that the Christian wife, the Christian son, and the Christian daughter, and the Christian servant need to submit to their superiors in their relationships. Uh, the, he's saying here that also the Christian husband, in a way, <clears throat> is expected to submit to his wife. This is an interesting thought. And also the Christian parents, in a way, are expected to submit to their sons and daughters. And also Christian masters are, in a way, also expected to submit to their servants. And that's why we see throughout this paragraph that he doesn't just address the wives. He doesn't just address the servants, and he doesn't just address the children. He also addresses the parents, I'm sorry, the, the husband, he also addresses the parents, and he addresses the masters. And so no Christian, in whatever position he is in the relationship, uh, he is, he, is he expected to domineer over the other person in that relationship, or to disrespect that person, or to take advantage of that person, or to abuse that other person? In all these relationships, that, um, that idea, that concept is across the board. If both people in the relationship are Christians, both are expected to treat one another and to be treated as siblings in the household of God. See, the, there, that's what makes it different, is that it's not just some master and servant uh, where the master feels that he can beat his servant. Okay, the, the issue is that the master is a Christian. And he's expected to treat his servant with respect. <clears throat> because that servant is a sibling, a, a fellow brother or sister in Christ, in the household of God. And so that person is an equal. And that person is to be treated with love. Because that person is Christ as well, is God's child as well. Both people in the relationship are expected to be courteous, to be considerate to be sacrificial, and to be giving to each other. And we're going to get into how each person is expected to do so and how they're expected to address the various sides of each of their relationships as we get into this paragraph. The second underlying concept, the first is that everybody is in one of these relationships. Uh, the second underlying concept is that this paragraph is that explains that every person who is in one of these relationships is required to have the fear of God in that relationship. <clears throat> Notice he says at the end of verse 21, he says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Uh, the assumption here is that in order for our relationships to work well in these different paradigms is that both sides of the relationship are saved and fear God. It's required. That the Christian on both sides, whether if it's the parent or the, or the son, whether if it's uh, the husband or the wife, whether if it's the master or the servant, both are required to not just be saved, but to fear God. And Paul points out here that the fear of God should be a motivating factor to every Christian, which is interesting. A lot of people, all they cry is love, love, and they, don't, and they say that we shouldn't preach the fear of God. But the fear of God is a vital motivational emotion for everyone to have a proper relationship with God and with each other. Fear of other things or people other than God will usually be a detrimental motivational factor. Okay, If you're fearing somebody else other than God, it's going to be detrimental to your life and to your relationships. Uh, this is especially true when the Christians fear causes him to develop another God. It causes the Christian to develop another God. When the Christian harbors fear of something or someone other than God, that causes him to fear, to obey, to worship, or to serve that other person or thing. And that person or thing then becomes that Christian's God. That person has now put up another idol in their heart and life. The Christian's fear should outweigh 
Uh, their fear, the, the Christian's fear of God should outweigh their fear of anyone or anything else. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 makes this very clear. Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So obviously God requires a lot more of our attention and fear because although they can just kill the body, it's God that we have to fear because it, life doesn't end when we die. And so without the fear of God, on the other hand, we ought not fear anyone other than God or anyone higher or, or to a greater degree than God because the fear of God, without the fear of God, there is no beginning of a relationship with God. We need to fear God to begin to even have a relationship with God. It's the fear of God that causes a person to realize that every sin that he has committed has incurred the wrath of God. And as we saw in the verse before, that it will not just incur the wrath of God, but the destruction of God. It's also the fear of God that causes a person to realize that he needs to flee the wrath of God and to embrace God's gift of love. See, we can't understand God's love and our need for God's love if it wasn't for the fear of God. And that gift of God's love is salvation through the work of Christ. And it's also the fear of God that causes the Christian, not just the unbeliever, to turn to Christ and start that relationship with God. It also causes the Christian to realize that he needs to obey and serve and worship and love God first and foremost in his life having no other gods before him. See, that, that command for God in the Old Testament, under the Mosaic Law, for God, when God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, that still applies. Not because we're still under the Mosaic Law, but because the principle still applies. There ought to be no other God uh, that can compete with him in our hearts and lives. And it's also the fear of God that causes the Christian to realize that he needs to treat his siblings in the household of God with respect and with love and with kindness, no matter what their station in life is. We are to treat everyone the same as God's children, as Christ. Every Christian must have a fear of his Lord in his heart and mind that if he mistreats another servant of the Lord or another child of our Lord, uh, he will give an account. Even if that person has a lower station in life. I can't just abuse somebody because uh, they have lower authority than I do or because I have authority over them. That doesn't give me the right. Uh, by lower station, I want to define that. I'm referring to having a relationship in which that person is generally expected to be submissive to a higher authority. Not because that other person is anything more special than them, but because that person is given higher authority, whether if it's in the familial sense, or the ecclesiastical sense, or the governmental sense, or the civil sense, like the idea of the master and servant. A good example of God's judgment upon his servants who mistreat other servants is exemplified in the Lord's parable in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. I won't have you turn there, but I'm sure that a lot of us are familiar uh, with that parable where uh, that Christ gives to exemplify how we should forgive one another. Uh, and he says that the servant of the master uh, who is forgiven much then goes to another servant of his master and uh, threatens him and puts him in prison because he owes him money. And so he's being disrespectful and not treating that person as Christ treats him, as his father also treats him. And that, that is, uh, and there that other servant is judged by uh, their Lord, by their mutual master. And so we see there that exemplified how we ought to treat one another appropriately because we're both, we're all servants of the same master and we're all children of the same father. And so the Christian who is truly born again should have assurance of salvation. The Christian that is truly born again should have assurance of eternal security. And the Christian that's born again should also have assurance that he's not going to be treated by God as anything other than a child of God. And so, yeah, we don't need to fear that God is going to cast us into hell and to eternally punish us 
uh, with eternal destruction. However, the Christian should have a real fear of God. Fear doesn't just refer to having respect or reverence. A lot of Christians today, they try to explain the word fear away and, and try to only leave God's love. And they say that fear there only means respect or, or reverence. The Greek word for fear, though, is the, weir, the word from which we get the transliter, transliterated word phobia. That's the word here that's translated fear is phobia. And so fear refers to having a pure fright, being frightened of something, or having terror of something. This is not just reverence. This is not just a, a godly respect. And so this is, of course, exemplified by the, by the fear that a child has of his father. We think about a young child, okay? The first thing that the child has to learn, unfortunately, is to fear his parents. He doesn't have to fear the stove. He doesn't have to fear the electrical outlet. Uh, what he, all he can understand is the fear of his father, of being punished, of disobeying. And it's that fear that the child should have that, that exemplifies the fear that should continue on in the relationship of that child with their heavenly father. They should have a true fear of God. And so the Christians should have a real fear of the lack of the right, of having a right, right relationship with his father. Uh, the Christian should also have a fear of the chastening hand of his father. And the Christian should have a fear of the coming judgment of his Lord. Not that he's going to be cast into hell, not that he's necessarily going to be uh, cast into what they call Christian purgatory, uh, but that the Christian will face his Lord one day. And we ought to have a healthy fear of that day that's coming. Not just the consequences now, not just the chastening hand of God in our lives now, but also that judgment, that great, that uh, judgment seat of Christ that's to come. Paul's point here is that the Christian who is expected to submit to his or her authority, doesn't necessarily have to fear the person who is his or her authority. Okay? I don't expect my wife to fear me. Uh, however, Paul's point here is that even if <clears throat> those who are expected to submit uh, don't fear them who have superior rank, they should still fear God. They should still fear that they will give an account to their God. Uh, the Lord will judge them for their lack of submission in those sphere of, spheres of authority and in which they are to submit. This also means that those with the superior rank should also have fear in their relationships. That the fathers should also have fear in their relationships with their wives. The parents should also have fear in their relationships with their sons and daughters. And masters should also have fear in their relationships with their servants. Not that anybody is necessarily fearing each other, but that there is a healthy, real fear of God in that relationship. <clears throat> and so I'm also going to refrain here from addressing the implications of governmental authority here, uh, whether if it's legitimate or illegitimate, uh, because I'm trying to stay on topic, but that is a serious issue that our government doesn't have. They don't have the fear of God, and so they take advantage of the citizens. And unfortunately, that's because they're neglecting uh, this point of Scripture, this principle that God here gives. And so in conclude, well, there are two more points, quick points. Uh, I believe here that the placement of this phrase at the end of the sentence is important that Paul is in introducing the coming paragraph at the end of this sentence because it's still a part of the subject of this sentence. By having verse 21 as the conclusion of this list of ways in which the Christian can walk circumspectly and wisely, uh, Paul here is likening the subject in both matter and in priority, that this is just important as the other subjects, uh, the other points of this sentence. <clears throat> And so understanding the Lord's will and walking in the Spirit and singing godly music and giving thanks and proper submission in our relationships are all equally important. They're all necessary to walk circumspectly and wisely. And so God is saying here that 
proper submission to one another on both sides of every relationship is vital to walking circumspectly and wisely. This is just as important of a, of a subject. And that's why he's going to go into further depth on it over this next paragraph. And so everyone here, by consequence of this lesson, now has a heads up on when not to come to church. Uh, if they don't want to hear correction regarding their relationship with their families, whichever side you're on. And so you can call in sick. Uh, although we're not going to require for you to make up the, the missed Sunday school lessons or sermons that I or pastor give, no matter how much we'd want to, uh, like my college used to do, uh, whenever we'd miss a chapel sermon, they would require us to come after uh, in the evening and watch one of those, uh, that, that chapel meeting. Uh, and so uh, that was how they made us make sure that we weren't just skipping chapel because we still ended up having to go on our own time. And... Uh, although a pastor and I would probably love for that to happen because it's always ironic how you prepare a, a lesson, you got somebody in mind, and then that person doesn't show up. You know? Not for that person. But let me clarify. Not for that person, but with that person in mind. I mean, there are times, just you know, like the other day, I mentioned uh, that I thank Chris because he mentioned um, that we have to care about our testimony. And I failed to mention that in that Sunday school lesson. And so the next Sunday school lesson, I remember to mention testimony. And, uh, you know, and so that wasn't necessarily preaching that to him, but I had something in mind that it was related to him. And so there are times when we, we might, might wish that, but we're not going to require somebody to later on prove that they watched the sermon or the lesson. And, but you should still come anyway, even though you might not want to hear the preaching and teaching related to you, uh, because of what we've already mentioned. Because you should have a fear of God. That you should be concerned that God will hold you accountable to properly treat others in your relationships. And that you should be concerned about that relationship in which God has placed you, that you have a biblical and godly relationship for the sake of the success of your relationship. So there's two very good reasons to come even, anyway, even though you might not want to come uh, for the following Sunday school lessons. And that was pretty much it. Next lesson, we're going to start looking at the wife. So you wives, uh, I'm expecting every one of you here, or I'm, I know that you're trying to skip out. <laughs> I'm just teasing. So uh, that, first, that first subject that's going to be addressed will be the wife's relationship to the husband. And uh, then we're going to go on to the other subjects. Yeah, so don't, now that you know it's coming, don't skip out. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have to spend in your word. We ask that you'll bless it to our minds and our hearts, that we will, uh, that we will produce fruit from the, the study and understanding of your word, that it will cause us uh, to draw closer to you and to obey you better. And we pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.